This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is the television voice of the Memphis Grizzlies, Pete Pranica. The Memphis Grizzlies will open up the NBA playoffs this weekend, their third straight appearance in the postseason. Last year, the Grizzlies owned home court advantage against the Los Angeles Clippers, but lost in a thrilling seven-game series, which concluded in Memphis with the Clippers downing the Grizz at FedEx Forum. The 2012-13 regular season has been a very eventful one for the hometown team. The Grizzlies have set franchise records for total wins and road victories. They have also overcome major changes to the franchise, including the change in ownership and management. If that wasn't enough, the team found a way to stay together after the major trade that sent valued teammate, not to mention leading scorer Rudy Gay, to Toronto. It's not often you see teams having success after dealing their leading scorer in midseason. But new CEO Jason Levian, with the blessing of new majority owner Robert Perra, saw it as a way to upgrade the roster while making a major financial decision for not only the present, but the future as well. The Grizzlies also dealt key role players, Maurice Spates and Wayne Ellington, while bringing in veteran Tayshawn Prince and talented Ed Davis and Austin Day. And after an understandable adjustment period, the Grizzlies' chemistry quickly evolved. The team actually seemed to be improved, like management predicted. But now comes the NBA's second season, and this is where they separate the contenders from the pretenders. Now, one man who's always in the middle of the action is Pete Pratica. No, Pete's not a shooter nor a rebounder, but Pete is as entertaining as the players themselves. He is the television voice of the Grizzlies, and he's simply one of the league's best play-by-play -play announcers. Today, Pete joins me to look back at the regular season and ahead of the playoffs, where the Grizzlies are hoping to avoid a repeat of last year. We roll out the pumpkin with the colorful and entertaining Pete Pranica next on Sports Files. Well, Pete, thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate it. It's been a terrific regular season for the Grizzlies. How would you assess it to this point? I think by just about any metric, it's the most successful season in franchise history. And when you look at the number of players that have worn the uniform, 20 at last count, and there may be more before the playoffs right. are over, uh, and the job that Lionel Hollins has done to keep everybody on the same page, on track, pun intended, through the Rudy Gay trade, through the change in ownership, the death of Dana Davis, the death of Kenny Williamson, to keep this whole thing on track and to have a franchise best season, I think speaks volumes about the organization and speaks volumes about Lionel Hollins. You're around the country at different NBA venues and, and arenas. What's it like from the other side when people look at Lionel Hollins? We know what he's done. And you make a great point to be able to, to coach all these different players and to coach them up so well and the chemistry still be there. What are the outsiders saying about Lionel? There's a tremendous sense of admiration, uh, whether you go to Dallas or you go to any of the other Southwest Division cities or you go out east. They say, we really like your team. We like Lionel Hollins. We like the style of play. We like the fact that there is more substance than there is style. And there's a lot of admiration for the Grizzlies. And it really, really goes back several years, Greg, because when the Grizzlies were starting under Lionel Hollins to kind of get their footing, a lot of people would say to us, we like your team. We like your coach. In a few years, you guys are going to be really good. The trade goes down with Rudy Gay. Of course, there were a couple of trades, and, and as we mentioned, a lot of player personnel moves. Pete, what was your initial reaction to the trade? And then what do you think about it today? My initial reaction was it's going to be some, some short-term pain mm -hmm. because you have, I think, your longest-tenured Grizzly. He had played more games than anybody else, more minutes than anybody else, uh, was approaching Pau Gasol's all-time leadership in points. And you understand it's a very large piece of your organizational history that's no longer there. You look at the salary cap situation and you look at the amount of money that Rudy was making and you're looking at Marcus Gasol making a big contract, Zach Randolph making a big contract, Mike Conley making a, a good dollar, and then oh by the way Tony Allen is an unrestricted free agent. Mm -hmm. Something's got to give and when you're looking at 
And, and if I were running the organization, I'm looking at, okay, who can you replace? Can you replace another wing scorer like Rudy Gay? Yeah, you can do that. Can you replace a Marcus Gasol? That's pretty hard. Can mm -hmm. you replace a Zach Randolph? That's really tough. Try replacing a Tony Allen. That's really tough. And so I, I thought there would be some short-term pain, but I think over the long term it was going to be better. And when you look at, you know, Rudy this year was, was not shooting the ball very well, and he was not a very efficient scorer, and I think that his style of play was, was – really at odds with what the Grizzlies needed to do, which is to play inside out through Mark and Zach. And so it was, uh, it, it's, it's a business decision. Uh, I think it was also a basketball decision and ultimately the right decision. The chemistry that was built up with the core players over the years was tremendous. And here you are breaking up the chemistry a bit. Were you surprised how quickly, there was a couple of games they stumbled a little bit while getting used to each other with Tayshaun Prince and Ed Davis and Austin Day joining, but they found that chemistry once again very quickly. Did that surprise you it was that quick? Not really. I mean, this has always been a very tightly knit group. I think Mark, uh, Mark Russell and Mike Conley have, have been very good friends, I think, since pretty much day one. Mm -hmm. They're always on the same page. Tony Allen is a very good locker room guy. And then you bring in Tayshawn Prince. And what I was most impressed with with Tayshawn, first walk-off interview, he says, I like being here. I just want to know where my teammates want me to give them the ball. Right. It's like, okay, you're, you're going to be flying <laughs> in the locker room. And, and the other thing with, with Tayshawn is here's a guy who's won Olympic gold. He's won an NBA championship. People are going to listen to him. And the word that we had gotten, and, and you know, you're around the league long enough, you hear this from everybody, consummate professional. Mm -hmm. And he absolutely positively is. All right, I'm going to ask you a tough question here. Okay. See if you want to dance around it or come right at us. Who is the MVP of the team this season? Oh, that, that, that is a very tough question. Um, because you have an all-star in Zebo, right. but you have Gasol, who is the best center in the NBA. Right. And then, wow, the improvement from Conley this year, where would they be without him? So it is tough. Yeah, I, I go back to my earlier thought about, you know, what can you replace? Uh, Mike Conley would be hard to replace, but there are a lot of good point guards out right. there. I, th I think Marc Gasol really and truly is one of a kind. When you look at going into the world of analytics for a second. Uh, when Marcus is on the floor, the Grizzlies give up, I think, 96 points per 100 possessions. When he's off the floor, it's like 103 points per possession. He is so incredibly valuable on both ends of the floor because he can handle the ball, he can shoot it, he can block shots, he can rebound, and he can assist. Uh, and, and he really does have the full package. If you're talking, maybe if we change it from most valuable to most irreplaceable, mm -hmm, there you th go. Th then, it, then it might it would be Marcus Hall. But you made the nice transition for me. You brought up the word analytics. You bring in new ownership led by majority owner Robert Parra. He knows all about that. He gets Jason Levy in here as the new CEO. He knows all about analytics. They bring in John Hollinger, who's a mastermind with numbers. What do you think about this new school basketball, this, this new regime, and the job they've done so far in piecing together this team, making the moves that they have made, and using analytics? Well, I think that they've done a very good job. I think the trade that they made initially to set up the Rudy Gay deal was very, very smart because it cleared out some room, uh, and you get John Luer back in trade. Uh, analytics, you know, people, when they hear that word, it's almost it's almost like a hot button right. where people mm -hmm. immediately request, well, I, we, we don't want to go with numbers. <laughs> when you go back and you look at the numbers and you compare them to what you see with your eyeballs, a lot of it correlates. You know, the eyeball test on Rudy said, okay, he's not shooting a high percentage, he's not an efficient scorer. And then you go back and you look at the numbers and you say, well, you know what, the eyeball test was exactly right. I think analytics, when properly applied, informs your decision. It doesn't make your decision for you because mm -hmm. you still need mm -hmm. that eyeball test. And uh, I've talked with a number of scouts, and they say, yeah, we can look at analytics, but if we're scouting a game, we want to watch how a player interacts with his coach, how he interacts with his teammates. So there has to be a balance between the eyeball test and between the numbers on a page. As we sit here, Pete, on the Grizzlies practice court, we do so not knowing whether the Grizzlies will open up with the Clippers or with the Nuggets. It looks like it will be... LA for a second straight year. Let, let's talk about the Clippers and the matchup. Last year, Grizzlies had the home court advantage. They lost in seven games. More than likely, they'll open in LA. What do you think about the matchup? Well, the matchup is a tough one for the Grizzlies, and I think the biggest hurdle they have to overcome, Greg, is it might be psychological. Mm -hmm. You look at Grizzlies getting home court advantage, blowing a big lead in game one, right. and then not being able to play well in game seven. Then this year, the, the Clippers come in, Grizzlies shoot the lowest field goal percentage for a home game in team history, and then last weekend they lose a game that they have a lead 
heading into the fourth quarter. I think psychologically the Grizzlies have to make sure that, that their minds are right. The Clippers are tough not only because they're long and athletic, but because they have so many highlight plays. And they can build momentum. They can generate momentum, unlike few teams in the NBA. The Denver Nuggets, ironically, might be the only other one that can generate momentum that way. For the Grizzlies to win the series, Greg, they have to play very strong basketball from their bench. Jared Bayless is going to have to average double figures. You're probably going to have to get double-figure games from Quincy Pondexter and Ed Davis. You're going to have to have somebody who can match Eric Bledsoe coming off the bench, somebody who can match Jamal Crawford coming off the bench. That's really the, the biggest advantage that the Clippers have in this series would be the ability of their bench to score points and be productive. Is there the worry about you're playing a team that has a quote-unquote superstar in Chris Paul, he'll get the calls, or do we blow that out of proportion? If you let it get inside your mind, then you're, you're not doing a good job. I mean, mm -hmm. you just have to say whatever the calls are, you just have to live with them and you have to continue to play through. Because if, if in playoff basketball, possessions are so much more tightly contested that if you are worried about whether you get a whistle or you don't get a whistle, then your mind may be gone for the next three possessions. And, and, you, and you can't do that. You just have to say, look, hey, they're better officials, uh, you know, the highest rated officials in the playoffs, and you just have to let it go. Pete, how can you look back at a season, and, and let's say the Grizzlies don't get by their first-round opponent, and they've had this incredible season during the regular year where they've set records for wins and road wins. Can you say it's successful, or does it have to show in the postseason? I, I think the gut reaction is it has to show in the postseason. The issue that the Grizzlies have is – the two potential opponents for them in, in the playoffs, they're two and six in the regular season. Mm -hmm. They're two, two against San Antonio. They take, take two or three from Oklahoma City. Uh, they have the edge on pretty much everybody else in the playoffs, right. except the two teams potentially they could face. The teams that have given the Grizzlies fits over the last two to three years have been the long athletic teams. And those are the two teams in Denver and the Clippers that the Grizzlies are most likely to face. You just told us a moment ago how you think the Grizzlies can win the series. Let me ask you this, who is the key player for the Grizzlies to come out of that series successful? I think it's going to have to be Zach Randolph. Mm. Uh, Zach has to play defense against Blake Griffin, keep him out of the paint, keep him away from the lobs, and, and Zach has to be a 20-10 and 10 guy and, and get a little bit of that postseason magic that he had against the Spurs two years ago. Let's talk a little bit about you. You've been in this business a long time. You've been calling NBA games 20 years, radio and television. How do you fire yourself up each and every night to go out there and, and give the best broadcast possible? I have the best job in the world. I mean, there isn't a night that you don't get excited about what you're doing. You never know what you're going to see. Uh, you could see a triple overtime thriller. You could see a blowout. You could see somebody go for 50 points. And just the fact that you can go there and sit courtside and be a part of it and be part of the excitement and to be part of an organization. And the Grizzlies organization has been fantastic to me. And, and Memphis has become a home to me. I'm from, originally from Wisconsin, nine years here now in Memphis, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and, and very pleased. With the team success, obviously, it's a great organization, also a great group of guys. I mean, some basketball teams, the players don't want to have anything to do with anybody but the other players. I mean, Mike Conley, Quincy Pondexter, Marcus Hall, all these guys, they know our names. They want right. to know our stories and talk to us and things like that. So it's, uh, like I said, I have the best job in the world. Who's the best to, what, give me one player the best to deal with today and maybe all time with the Grizzlies. Uh, one of my all-time favorites was Mike Miller. Mike is just a real salt of the earth Mine guy. As well. He and he and his wife Jen uh, donating money to a children's hospital in South Dakota. Mm -hmm. uh, he was always there and would host us at the Adidas Company store out out in Portland to make sure that that we were taken care of. And I, I've always enjoyed seeing Mike. And Mike will always come over and say hello. Um, right now, I, boy, I, I enjoy so many of them. I, I knew Zach Randolph when he was 19, and. Uh, uh, I was at Stackstacular, and a lot of people wanted their picture taken with Zach, and Zach says, no, I want – Pete can take his picture with me first because he knew me when I was 19. How about that? And and, and Zach never forgot because we were together in Portland, and uh, a, a really, really a quality guy. And I, I'm happy to see his career flourish as it has here in Memphis. That's loyalty with a capital mm -hmm. L. Yep. You have a, a rarity because you work with two analysts, and also on the radio side, the Grizzlies have two analysts. I don't know if that's – being done in the NBA uh, at another place, but I would imagine it's rare. Two great guys who I know very well and Brevin Knight and Sean Tui. What's the difference working with those two? And you have to get yourself ready to work with a different style each game when they're doing it. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, Sean takes pride in not preparing for a game. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I've, I've got stacks of notes, and he teases me about my index cards right. and all that. And and Sean is very much, uh, if he were a golfer, which he is, he, he's a field player. Reactionary? Very, very reactionary. Uh, he has some thoughts about how he thinks the game should go, but he is more reactionary to what happens on the floor. Brevin thinks the game like a player and like a coach, mm -hmm. and he will make a number of notes, and he is more X's and O's oriented in terms of going under screens, going over screens, pick and roll here, uh, pick and pop there, you know, those types of things. The commonality is that they're both wonderful guys. I play golf with both of them. They're two of my dearest friends in the world and, and really quality people. Pete, give us a tip for youngsters out there that want to follow in, in both our footsteps, but they want to be a television or even a radio play-by-play -play broadcaster. I think number one is you need to find an outlet where you can get on the air or get reps. And if that means taking a tape recorder out to AutoZone Park mm -hmm. with a microphone and, and doing play-by-play. -play. When I was a kid, I'd set up a card table in front of a television, watch an NBA game, I'd set up a microphone and a tape recorder, and, and that's... Guilty. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we all, we, we all do it. I would say that that's the first thing. The second thing, Greg, is learn how to write. With the advent of blogs, uh, the ability to be a wordsmith, to tell stories, to use proper words, uh, and, and usage I think is invaluable uh, because it, it seems like we're getting away in some sense from the written word so I think that the person who can write well and uh, build their vocabulary it will help you because if you can organize your thoughts on paper it will help you organize your thoughts up here when during a play-by-play -play broadcast as you well know is essentially two two and a half hours of extemporaneous speaking well said Pete you're off the hot seat but we got Five for the road here. So okay. five, five questions, okay. quick answers, first thing that comes to mind. Okay. I think I know the answer to this one. <laughs> Your favorite professional sports franchise, you can't say the Grizzlies, though. Green Bay Packers. The, and tell everybody why. Uh, I grew up about 10 miles north of Green Bay and had season tickets when I was a kid growing up. Wow. Who's your favorite player from the Packers? I'm going to ask you another question about favorite players of all time, but from Green Bay specifically. Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers. All right, your favorite professional athlete, any sport, can't say Aaron Rodgers or any of the Grizzlies. <laughs> Favorite professional athlete, uh, past or present or? Past or present. I'm going to say Joe Dumars. Joe Dumars. Mm -hmm. hmm, okay. Your favorite music, musician, group, what do you like to listen to? Um, do you like to listen to music? I, I love to listen to music. Okay. All kinds of music. That, that might be the bigger problem because uh, I'm going to go classical here. I knew you were going to go classical. I'm going to go classical uh, with a Finnish composer, Arvo Pärt. You're killing me, Pete. I knew, I, knew you were go I, I knew you were going classical. Two more questions for you. Favorite movie of all time? Favorite movie of all time? Um, Bull Durham. Great choice. Great. If it wasn't a sports movie, do you have one? Uh, Just off the top of your head? River Runs Through It. Okay. Final question for you. Favorite television series of all time? Favorite television series of all time? Night Court. Night Court was terrific with Harry Anderson, but what about today? What would you watch today? Or what do you watch today? Uh, the only episodic television I watch is uh, Sherlock. Sherlock. On BBC. Yeah. Very cerebral. Mm -hmm. He's very cerebral. He's also terrific at what he does. Well, Pete, thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Looking forward to listening to you and watching you come postseason time. Thanks. For many years, local race fans were able to get in their fix of motorsports by simply hopping in their vehicle and heading over to Memphis Motorsports Park. There was NASCAR and NHRA and everything in between. Then the track was sold and the racing went away. But now racing is back. Memphis International Raceway is the new name, and once again, it's a part of the Memphis and Mid-South communities. And while the hope is that we'll one day soon see the return of NASCAR and NHRA events, and the IHRA is already on the schedule, the fact of the matter is the future looks bright for Memphis International Raceway and motorsports in general. Last weekend, the very popular Super Chevy show returned with something for everyone, from side-by-side -side racing to jet cars to an old-fashioned swap meet. There was excitement everywhere you turned. So we sent a Sports Files camera crew out there to take in some of the action. So sit back and relax.
The Super Chevy Show is the biggest show for your Chevy enthusiasts. There is a series of 12 that go across the country. We're one of those 12. We are also one of the largest of those 12 shows, and it is for the enthusiasts for a car show, a swap meet, car corral, drag racer, we bring in wheel standards, uh, jet cars, and a pro mod show that, you know, they're gonna get them on their feet. It's an exciting day for the Chevy enthusiasts. The show is geared towards a family-friendly environment. Uh, we have every age group from one all the way up to our seniors, and we love every single one of them. 17 and under um, can drive in our Junior Dragster program, and we have quite a few of those on property this weekend, and our program on a weekly basis also offers the Junior Dragster program, and uh, it's an exciting group. Rusty Wallace has come on board with the facility for five years. They will be the leaser of the paved oval for driving experiences. They've also added a uh, go-kart program within their driving experience of stock cars. So they're gonna be in our community for five years. They've made a commitment and an investment to build that business here in the market. The biggest thing is for folks to know that we are a multi-facet facility. We are not the facility that you're only gonna be able to see drag racing, only gonna be able to see uh, oval racing. We have multiple facilities. We have a drag strip, which is a quarter mile drag strip, we have a 1.77 mile road course. We have an autocross facility. We also host drifting. We do team testing as well as driving experiences on our three quarter mile paved oval. So the amount of racing and the variety of racing is just endless and we offer it for every person. The test and tune that we hold on a weekly basis and the midnight madness that we hold once a month gives our spectators a chance to become the show. And what I mean by that is anybody 16 and older who has a valid driver's license can bring their personal car out and race the quarter mile. It is the safest, the only legal way to drag race. And we have all of the safety equipment on site to ensure for the safety, but it brings the spectator to the show and folks then begin to see them race. And then once they get further involved in that, that's when you can go into your class racing. They can go into your electronics, non-electronics, street cars, DOT, which is a street program, and then your junior dragsters as well. So the test and tune leads into bigger racing and then eventually does lead into the IHRA racing, which is your super comp, comp and so forth. We have a local racing program, the Summit Bracket Racing Series presented by Comp Cams. And what that does is allow our racers here in the local area, within a tri-state area, to come out with their race cars, participate in a 14 race series for points, and then at the end of the year there will be a points fund that is awarded to them, like you see in some of your IHRA programs across the country. This is the local level of that program. And then those racers from that program, if they're your track champion, have the opportunity to go on to your team and world finals and then compete in the IHRA World Finals here in Memphis in October. So it is a graduated program that our local tracks feed into for racing. If you've ever had the desire to see how fast your car can go, this is the place to do it. This is the safe place to do it. We have the necessary equipment here to make sure that you're in a safe environment. We want to keep it off the streets. We want to keep our public safe. We want to keep our children safe and we want to put it in a controlled environment and allow you to have as much fun as you wish. We do not limit the amount of runs that they can run during Test and Tune. We encourage them to do it in a safe place at Memphis International Race. And our thanks to Pam Kendrick, the Vice President and General Manager of Memphis International Raceway, for being our tour guide. A couple of notes before we say goodbye. The Memphis Tigers hoop roster continues to evolve for next season. Guard Joe Jackson announced on Monday that he will return for his senior season, while fellow guard Antonio Barton has decided to transfer. Barton joins forward Tarek Black in opting to change destinations. Meanwhile, forward Adonis Thomas has made himself available for the NBA draft. And finally, sports usually provides us with a chance to escape the sometimes harsh reality of life. But on Monday, the two worlds collided. Two bombs detonated in and around the finish line of the Boston Marathon. Many innocent people were hurt. Some even lost their lives. All this while running a race. Dozens of runners hailed from the Mid-South. 
and what should have been a day of accomplishment turned into a day of horror. It's also a day that will always be remembered, but unfortunately now for all the wrong reasons. Our thoughts and prayers go out to all those directly affected by the tragedy in Boston. And that'll do it for this week. We'll see you next time.